All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to, I can't even keep count anymore, this, this evening's uh, Beirut Banyan, live from Alias. Um, and I'd just like to introduce you to your uh, host, Rani Shatah. Thank you guys you can way. applause if you want. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> this is a bit of a bittersweet episode for two reasons. The first is this gentleman Wa'il is leaving the country in what, five days, six days? Yeah, like six days. Boo. Bravo, Nielo. Thank you. <laughs> That's actually funny. I think your chair broke <laughs> as a result. No, the reason I'm disappointed is because all the good people leave. Yeah. So you should not be leaving, in my opinion. You're staying. I'll good always luck. be back, don't worry. Good You'll luck. be back? I'll always be back, don't worry. Don't look back. I Be look back, but don't look back. Gotcha. Zeven, it's not your turn to speak. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you had a television show for 15 okay, years. Give me sorry. a yeah, yeah. Right. This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatar, and this is The Beirut Banyan. We met in 2009. That's right. And I think it may have been the spring or summer when I started giving walking tours in Beirut. And well, you must have come on one of my first tours. Uh, I believe so. So I was an amateur back then. You seem like you knew what you're talking about. <laughs> It's quite nice, actually. Thank you. I was an amateur, but I seemed like <laughs> I was pretending to know what I'm doing. Uh, that's 14 years ago. Yeah. In the last 14 years... A long time has passed. I stopped giving that tour, but on the way, I got to meet profound storytellers that I respect and deeply admire, including today's guest, Zaven Kuyumjian. Thank you. And I'm going to mention this, even though Zaven asked me many times to stop doing this. The tour that Wa'il came on is a partial inspiration partial for a recent book Zaven published called Beirut Guilty Pleasures. We're going to talk about that book today. No? Boo? We're not. <laughs> This is for the inspiration. Inspir bring, bring the microphone a little closer yeah, to yeah. you, yeah? And let's mute him. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Let me start by saying the subject is also bittersweet. And the reason it's bittersweet to me is because everything you write about Zaven is post-war memory that I grew up with. And a lot of what you do is actually, is actually capture my generation's journey, which is not only negative, but a lot of it is. And you document the good stuff in a way that makes sense to you. And what I mean by that is that you're tossing prosperity and tragedy together in easy-to-access books. You're also a media expert. You have a very profound career in Lebanese media. So I consider you a journalist, a media analyst. You're a lecturer at the Lebanese American University. You're also a podcaster today. I've been on your podcast twice. So if there's anyone that can transcribe this journey, it's you. And I grew up watching you on TV. And thanks to you, you've been sharing clips of things that now seem ancient history, like the first time an email was checked on Lebanese television. And I love these clips. And it's 1998 or so, 99, around then. No, even before, 96. 96. You also were on, this, on the ground during Kana, 1996. You've been part of the media landscape for so long that I think it's important to reflect on you as much as we can without embarrassing you. Let me start by asking you a simple question. I outlined many things you do, 
And if somebody asked me, what do I do? I get confused. I don't yeah. know how to describe myself. But I sense you have a similar issue and that you do many things at once. So maybe one word doesn't sum it up. But for anyone that doesn't know who you are, how would you define yourself? I always define myself as a serious journalist. And that's the title I like the most. Uh, but I was in Tunisia uh, last week and I realized I enjoy dealing or talking or interacting with people who don't know me. Hmm. Because it's a, yeah, because when people know me, there is a certain code of ethics that I have, like a certain behavior I have, I have to follow as a, يلا هي راح تساعدك هلا هون كسرت يلا بس تخلص تاع it's so sad very sad We're... you know I'm going to interrupt your your introduction because your books in my mind were trying to capture this in history and we're living through something once more and I want to go down that road with you as much as I can today. But go ahead, keep keep describing how you. No, no, I, I, now I'm I, I, I'm in a different mood now. I'm very sad of what's happening in the country. I've I've put lots of investment in my life, in my dreams, in my career career wise. I, I believe that I'm I, I'm I'm considered to be the generation of war, the fruit of war, because I, I've. I've lived the whole war and when when I was 20 I was told the war is over and I believed that we can start over I believed that this can be a beautiful happy Lebanon once again and now seeing this I know poverty always exists everywhere even in the most in the strongest economies but what we're witnessing now is really sad and in 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 where we are in the middle of something that we see no hope. This is why when your friend and colleague here is leaving, you, you cannot but face that with mixed feelings of, you want to be happy for him, but at the same time, it's very sad that everybody is leaving. My family today is half here, half not here. I don't know if tomorrow I'm here or not here. But we don't want to be sad now. So that's, Let's move on. I'm, I'm happy that you're back on the scene. There were years that went by that you kind of faded a bit. And you're back. Did I? I think so. Mm, you faded, okay. but I think you, you faded in a way that made sense to you because now you're making a... No, I didn't fade. I didn't fade. You're, you're, you have a comeback in digital media. I didn't have a comeback because I didn't fade. I'm glad you're... I have two dreams in my life. Uh, like I've done everything on TV. So I had two things that I, I wanted to do. Yeah. One was to be naked on TV. <laughs> now, now I cannot do that with my, uh, uh, yeah, with my weight. And second, I'd like once to eat on TV or on camera. So can I have something to eat? You can take off your clothes too. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go to the gym for three years and then, then we'll think ahead. about it. And then, then I will fade out. Okay, you know you're right. I let's I, eat something. I, I have you ever done your podcast while eating? Yes, with ah, Wi okay. William Noon. Ah, he was after his interrogation. He met me at a restaurant. Okay. We sat down, we ate, and we talked. Okay, that's the only one I've done. So now, if I'm do if I do it, I'll be inspired by you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me okay, by the way, Ronnie was an inspiration for my book, for my last book. He was really an inspiration and I'm very serious about it. I did this book because everybody was talking about him as the person who shows the better face of Beirut, the real Beirut. And then I said, why don't I do that also? I can share, I can share the Beirut I know in a book. And I started working about this book. Uh, I started working on this book and the first thing I wanted to do when I finished this book is to meet you. Oh. 
I haven't told you this story. So I wanted to meet you and give you this book to share it with your uh, with the groups that you you tour the city with. And then everything happened and everything changed. Well, something else happened. I did two episodes with your wife, Lori. Yes, and then that was another frustration for me. <laughs> usually, <laughs> usually I like to be the first <laughs> in the family. If so she did Roni, I didn't do Roni. And then I had to wait like for another year to do Roni. If Click one, Roni, if, finish. If one thing hasn't faded, it's your ego. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me start the episode over. <laughs> Recalibrate this discussion. I grew up with you in the background. Yes. And your first book... That's not flattering, by the way. We're 10 years apart in age, okay. I think. I was in my prime as an adolescent. Hi, Eva. Watching you, in a way, merge traditional media with what became alternative media later. Yeah. You also wrote a book that I kept on my bookshelf for years and years and years, Lebanon Shot Twice. That's one of the best post-Civil War books published, and that's thanks to you. I think it's the fourth edition that's out now, or the fourth or fifth? Fourth. Fourth edition. Officially fourth, but it's the fifth, because there was one edition that we did two prints. Okay, and the reason it's being updated, I think, is because Lebanon was not shot twice. It was shot several times, obviously. And there's somewhere in the book that it says before, after, and after. And after, after. After, yeah. And that's very sad. Also. Absolutely. Because some places you don't see... The concept of before and after, after should be better than before. Yeah. And then you have the before. Sometimes before is better. And the after, after is like the worst in the three. So that was another journey. Because uh, Lebanon shot twice... It's a journey in the most famous war photography of Beirut. So basically, it was a restructuring or revisiting the photo through uh, searching for the people in the photo and taking back to the same places and capturing their stories. Because I think the war has been narrated through the stories of politicians or analysts or historians, but it was never told through real people who, re who lived real life. The witnesses, the, the people who lived, like ordinary people. Uh, so in this book, I tried to capture those moments through those frozen moments in photography. And I noticed, I'm going to jump, we're going to talk about yeah. Beirut Guilty Pleasures on its own. But Lebanon Shot Twice is human-focused. Yeah. Beirut Guilty Pleasures is not. It's location-focused. Wow, yes. And I noticed this when I was comparing the two today. Wow, yeah. And that's why I had a bittersweet moment, is because I saw a lot of what I grew up with damaged today. You know, you mentioned the most recent version, examples like The Ring. The Ring during the Civil War. The Ring immediately after the war. The Ring during October 17. And The Ring today. It's what I grew up with. And there's, it's not moving in the right direction. Yes. It's moving back and forth. There's and that's even bad, you know. And you know, this back and forth makes you like not stand on on solid grounds. Yeah, makes you feel like you're not stable. You don't know the direction. Or even walls. There's yeah. a there's an emphasis with people standing next to walls during the war yeah. for horrible reasons, and then suddenly there's walls erected in downtown, walls that come down, and now they're back up. And I noticed that there's a deliberateness in this most recent edition in that Lebanon's civil war is not over, the way I think the book first hinted at. You are 10 or so years older than me um, and your whole post-war experience. Do you feel that way today? Of course the war has ended because war is pain, is death in the family, is people dying. Now we don't have people dying because of war or because of... Uh, of warfare. We have people dying because they have lost their dreams. Well, you do bring up the port blast. Yeah, people of course. die. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. me, that's civil yeah, of war. Course. Yeah, of course. But civil war is very painful. Yesterday, I was having a dinner on Mother's Day with a, with a friend and his mother. And I was with my mother since my wife is not here. So we had like the, the mother-son dinner. And, and suddenly she told me that her father was massacred 
was killed in a massacre in one of the regions in 1977. And what's painful for her is that this mass massacre is never mentioned in the narrative of the war. No one talks about that massacre and more than like 50 people who died that day. War is very painful. I know what that means. War, but sometimes instability, crisis, not having a vision, not having a direction, thinking that can you afford a living or not is, is an, another war. But war as civil war is over. Maybe not civil during war. The, but, during but the civil war, I couldn't visit my aunt because she was on the other side of the, of the wall. Uh, and in 1990, when the war ended, that, that meant for me the war ended because now I could go visit my aunt on, in, on the other side of the wall and not be considered a traitor or a spy to the other side. Then how would you describe this most recent version? Because the photos that you're focusing in on reflect the civil war. Yeah. Within your right, there's no snipers, there's no checkpoints. There's the port blast, but the way you throw these stories back and forth, it's almost like the Civil War is stuck in time. At least that's what I got from the most recent version. I can't think of any other way to describe the port blast as well. I know it's not Civil War, but it's this battlefield problem, and Beirut is getting destroyed in the process. So how do, how do you... I'm guessing... I'm asking how do you choose your... your what, do you, what you focus in on the most recent version? Let just to end the war thing, like just as as an, as a as a final punchline on this. I think it was now we are we are vic during the war. We are victims of bombs, snipers, whatever. Now we are victims of corruption. Uh, so in both cases, we are victims as Lebanese people or Lebanese the silent majorities of Lebanon, and that's very sad. As of how I chose my photos for Lebanon shot twice, uh, basically, uh, I, uh, all my childhood, I used to live in Verdun. Hmm. So Verdun was a kind of away from, uh, the, uh, from like violence and the uh, street wars or whatever. But I always heard. So for me, the war was something I hear. And next day, I wait for the newspaper to see what has happened. And so I started to have this special relationship with newspapers. Uh, and I, I think at that time, I, well, the whole, my persona went into journalism. Mm. So, uh, and sometimes because when, when the sounds were strange or, 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 or a bit like, you know, left me in fear or whatever, uh, I used to cut the photos and put them aside. So it, I had this, uh, the war memory for me is a sound that I don't know the reason of. And next day, a photo of a victim or a crying mother or whatever. So in uh, around 2000, when I decided to do this book, uh, at that time, Lebanon was the, in the mode of we want to forget everything about the war and yeah. we want to like, Alt delete and start over. Right. And I felt I have a story to tell. So I decided to work on this book. And the, the main, my, my main like uh, challenge about this book was now I know where I am, but I don't know those people. Where are they? So I started my search and initially it started uh, for an episode uh, for my show. And it just dragged me. I couldn't stop. So every, every time I was finding a photo, I wanted more. Because I was so curious. I felt those people are part of me, part of my memory, part of my childhood. I want to make sure they are okay as I was okay. You said Control-Alt-Delete yes. in the year 2000? Yes, the first that edition. was like, yeah. That's why I think of you as that kind of marker. So that book, and at least the way I remember it, was that that's a story that's over. And now there's going to be post-war only, not free fall, not yes, collapse, not violence. The last 23 years have been that roller coaster. So your journey, I think, is part of that. And you, you've, in a way, you rode the media landscape accordingly. You're most known for a post-war television station that's gone. 
future TV. Yes. I know that you were on other stations. I know that there is a moment in TL and yes. etc. But future and you go hand in hand. And you stayed until the last the last hours, if you will, of that station's yes. history. It's gone. Uh, there's a lot of what you focus in on in the books that are not positive stories today. I know we have a nostalgia both of us share for the Green Line, for downtown Beirut and the way it looked post-war, and maybe some of that architecture that's gone forever. But I would assume both of us are not happy with the way it looks right now. And the eeriness it reflects, to me at least, the 1990s, the early 90s. Yes. But now, this moment, I have nostalgia also to future TV. Because that's also gone. And it was, come think about it now, it was a good moment. Yeah. And sometimes they tell me I look very, I look younger on TV. <laughs> and I tell them, well, that was like, it was taped 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about that yeah. you spent years and years on future tv now you're looking back in fond memory of future tv yeah how do you how do you describe that today what is that to you for me that's not post-war that's in a way the last stretch of this country finally falling yeah it's bizarre you don't know what to think about it like you don't know like what's happening what's really happening we don't know all I know that something went wrong, something very big went, went wrong. We are victims of corruption. The system collapsed. There was a system ready to take over. And some of the Lebanese didn't let that happen. So now we are in the phase of no system. No one is ready to take over. over. And whoever is, so you are, you are not trying to save an old system. You are not tr trying to establish a new system. You are just fighting a system that is ready to take over. So you're, you're fighting nothing. Yeah. Well, I didn't imagine it would start this bleak. You know, I, um, and these are not easy conversations anyway, but I've done an episode with you before. Yeah. And we focused, I think, on the slightly more positive angle yes. of post-war tourism. So with your permission, I'll jump to that right now, because that's the focus of yeah. Beirut Guilty Pleasures. And I call that Guilty Pleasures, which is also not very positive. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but in Beirut Guilty Pleasures, mm. you're kind of taking both Lebanese and foreigners on a journey of Beirut that's not doing well. But it's almost, it's tourism-like. In that, for example, you take people to the Holiday Inn. That's not a tourism destination, but you're treating it as such. And that building is still there yeah. in the same, dis same decrepit state. I think it will be there for the rest of our lives in that state. But you're treating it literally like a tourism stop. And that, to me, is not the type of tourism I would want Lebanon to be celebrated for. But there is that element in the book that let's own it. And you call it guilty pleasures, I guess, for that reason. But is that an admission to you that things are stuck in that state of affairs and that that is what we celebrate now? In other words, the Holiday Inn stuck in time? Or for that matter, another stop in the book, Burj al Mur, which will be Burj al Mur probably as well for the rest of our lives. But you're really, you're celebrating these shells, these war relics. So um, I guess I'm asking, is this a deliberate way of admitting that yeah. the post-war yeah. story is not rosy, it's really stuck in time? Yeah, you have those landmarks in the city stuck in time, and suddenly suddenly you have people def uh, like defending them and wanting them to stay because they became landmarks for the city, and they, they have lots of memories, good and bad. And, uh, and because people are not sure if whatever new is coming is good or bad also, they are not... They are not. They don't trust whatever is coming. Uh, but for me, this is part of. It's it's called ruin porn, ruin ruin porn, whatever. Ruin porn. Yeah. So because some people get excited in ruins, and there is tourism. There is whole thing like. Uh, and I say in the book, I don't want Beirut to be this ruin porn destination. Uh, 
But you treat it as such. The book is that. that that's why I, I say it's guilty pleasures because you see, I've seen lots of people, especially Japanese, Europeans, they come and like the first thing they want to do in Beirut to have a photo in front of Holiday Inn, especially mm. because that's like the most famous landmark and it has this international dimension to it. Uh, so they just stand there and they take this photo because I, I used to work nearby. So I always pass from there every day for 15 years. So I see like people standing and doing like, you know, those poses and selfies in front of the Holiday Inn. And they, they stand at a point close to Burj Al Mar where the whole of Holiday Inn is in your background. And they are happy, but I always think that's like, this is war. This is the face of the Lebanese war. Because of this building, Beirut was divided into East and West. And this East and West, it's in respect to Holiday Inn. Uh, but this is what happens in life. Life continues. Things are like, everything is, it becomes like, people like to celebrate memories. Uh, or historical memories or landmarks or things they've seen on, on the news. Uh, it's strange. This is why I call the, the book uh, Guilty Pleasures because even when you smile in front of those places, you have always to, remem to remember that people died there. And mothers, some mothers are still searching for their, uh, for their sons or daughters who went there to fight for their cause because Holiday Inn, like Holiday Inn has like, I don't know, like very strange stories of the Holiday Inn. One of the stories you like is the elevator story. Yeah. Everything was down only for the elevator was still operating. So the only light in Beirut for like a week was an elevator going up and down and the militiamen playing in, in the elevator because obviously there was a battery to make sure that this elevator was like the quickest, fastest express elevator in the Middle East. So it was like the wow moment of, of the city. Yeah, so because there was a batter a backup battery for the elevator, which was like the like the pinnacle of technology in 1975, 74, 5. You know, this let's go a, a step deeper into this hotel um so i, I think yeah. now our situation we are in this elevator going up and down <laughs> without knowing what's happening but you know when i when i started <laughs> exactly when i started that tour i would look up at the holiday inn every day with groups of 40 sometimes 50 people with me looking at it trying to remember it as much as i can because I expected that building to be brought down. And I wanted to look at it and remember it because that was going to be part of my past as well. Yeah. And I spent years doing that. And I actually started knowing where the trees are. On each balcony, I started seeing engravings of Fatah on the cement. I knew every soldier that was living there. And I was trying to remember that because part of me thought that, yeah, this is going to be post-war temporary bulldoze to the ground something else it's still there one of the best decisions i made and partial inspiration comes from a man sitting way in the back who's been on the podcast tom young a very talented painter i'm going to embarrass him for a second he's way in the back is tom here tom Where is here is he? tom, tom spent spent so much time in the holiday inn painting the holiday inn yeah. and i think yes there he is in the back and he, I think, maybe drove my curiosity a bit too far, where I decided to help myself into the Holiday Inn. I was a bit reckless, but I wanted to see it from inside. I went all the way to the top, to that Panorama restaurant. The name escapes me now. I think it's Panorama or something like that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it will come up. Now. Yeah, the nightclub with the rotating bar at the top. Pinnacle or whatever. Yes. There, we'll say it again. The pinnacle. Pinnacle. Well done. Pinnacle. I went up. I mean, it's trees and bats. At night, it's dangerous. The Holiday Inn is two buildings stuck together. There's a crack in the middle you can fall in if you're not careful. I went in with a Nokia flashlight. This is pre-iPhone, and I wanted to see it. I wanted to feel it because I really thought it's a matter of time. I never... <laughs> Save that for the Q&A. <laughs> I, 
I, I never imagined at age 41 that I would still drive by the Holiday Inn. You know why? Because no one owns the Holiday Inn now. It was owned by a company, Kuwaiti, Lebanese company. And uh, it was supposed to be like the, the company uh, had a life, lifespan for, I don't know, 50 years, 25 years. It finished and uh, no one owns it. And there is big dispute among the inheritors of who does what, what do they do with it. And in the first place, there is no, no com the company that owns the building died. The uh, St. Charles yes. uh, there is company. No more, yeah. In this case, uh, the state should intervene and do something with it, like to put it in, on, in auction or whatever. And even when they do that, no one is interested to do anything about it. But I want to ask you if you feel the same way. When I look at it now, I don't want it there. Now I don't have this kind of post-war emotions yeah. for the holiday. Because and that, you feel at war now. Yeah. And I think the war generation did not have that kind of yes, relationship yes, to of it. Course. That's why I was trying to get at this phase. For me, it harkens back. It brings back the 80s all the time. This paralysis, currency, collapse, yes. instability, violence, low-level violence increasing. And I think that's your most, version, the most recent version in a way honors that. I think one day they should. Now I don't see the holiday when I'm passing. I don't see it. You I'm got passing so used in front of St. George, I don't see it. Bergelmer, I don't see it. It doesn't mean anything. In the, in the, in the good days, uh, in the second Swiss era of Lebanon, it meant those are lessons. Yeah. Now they don't mean anything. That's interesting. So they actually, you don't... I don't see them. Yeah, I don't see them. This is why I wanted to capture, capture them in the book. We both helped ourselves into the Grand Theater, and maybe in ways we shouldn't have. Yes. And we know this because that's that's dangerous. That was very yeah. Because in the Grand, if if anyone likes to go into those ruined buildings, don't do the Grand Theater, because uh, there are holes in it, and they take you to the Mediterranean. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Um, several people like were lost in the building, and no one talks about them. There's something that happened between us. Uh, the last time we recorded an episode, I think it's in the episode, Zaven mentioned that there's a sign from the Civil War stuck in the earth where it refers to landmines near the building. And both of us were thinking during the recording that one of us will go that night and grab that sign. That sign's gone. Yes. Someone took it. When you told me, I didn't believe you, so... A few weeks ago, I went there and I was looking. We we're both looking for the yeah, sign. Yeah, for the yeah. sign. The sign when, 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 like, it was very surprising to see a sign from the war saying, uh, be careful, mines here, Intabeh al -Ghan. And I saw it when Beirut was in its, like, best moments. So, uh, it sometimes, some, sometimes things escape from history and remain in your face, like this sign, Intabeh al -Ghan. And Beirut was like happy then, or so we thought. Grand Theater and another structure in downtown, the Egg or the Dome or the whatever, the city center, that's both in the book. Those are the only two stops I noticed that in a way celebrate the, the structure during October 17. And I'm yes. guessing you were there. Yes. during that moment. I was actually doing an episode with an artist named Jed al -Khuri. I think you may know him. Yes, of course. He would climb I, the Holiday Inn and paint yeah. on the side of the building. He took paint barrels to the top of the egg during the protests yeah. and was coloring the egg. Yeah, and it's in the book. And it's in the book. Yeah. So I was doing an episode with him from the egg talking about what he's doing. The egg and Grand Theater, for me, are moments of glory yes. during October 17, but in your most recent version, once more, you show them how they are right now. One's a very dangerous structure, and the egg is gone. The use of it is gone. People don't use the egg anymore, and it's been years. And I think it'll be like that for a very long time. So that to me is also- It's, the a, it's a private property now. It's a Saudi private property. But it was private during the protests too, and it was being used. I attended as a public 
space. Yeah. yeah, even AUB was doing lectures there. Guests on the podcast were giving lectures yeah. in the middle of downtown, but it's locked. And I think it's it's hard to imagine these places blossoming again. So that kind of thread where we are right now, do you see another before and after happening? Or do you think of this one as almost like a final after? Because the book does not hint at anything good coming. And the updated... It doesn't? No, not the way I read it. No. And Beirut Guilty Pleasures is not celebration. It's we're in hell and let's go on a tour of hell. So are you yeah. able to maybe see something better happening again? Because the post-war generation to me seems like it's over. It's really black. I'm, I'm, I'm not that negative usually. I try to be very positive. I do a morning show. I'm very happy even if the dollar is 130K. Uh, but I don't know. When I'm sitting with you, I feel like I have to be real. Uh, whatever is happening is happening. This is our life today. We have to admit. This is our life today and we are not able to do anything to change it. Some people tried, some people are like so uh, disappointed not to be able to try. Uh, but there's a big disappointment from everything, from the system, from the people who tried to ch change the system, from the people who were ready to establish a new system and they failed. So there's disappointment in everything. And it, in this disappointment, those landmarks of Beirut, and I have 12 landmarks, it starts from Beirut port and ends in Beirut Museum, uh, including the feast, the egg, Burj al uh, St. George. Uh, it all, like, those resemble Beirut today. Like, for the next 20 years, those landmarks might be the best thing that Beirut offered to humanity. Are you serious? I'm Unfortunately, yes, I am. The port? That's the best thing because that's the only thing people know about uh, Beirut. Meaning the best thing, that's, Be that's what Beirut stands for today. A port blast that the government is responsible of and no one did anything about it. And those people partially responsible of it were re-elected in public elections uh, uh, supervised by the European Union. Is there anything more bizarre than that? No. In that bizarre universe, you've gone a very unique I just road. want to be guilty in front of it. So you're being extremely honest about it. Yes. And that you know... Okay, I see. Well, Lebanon... And I say in the book, we failed to be a... Uh, we failed to be a message because, like, we saw ourselves for for years that Lebanon is a message, Lebanon Risala. Today I say, sorry, we failed that someone has to come and confess and say the Pope was wrong because we made him wrong. We are not a lesson anymore. We are not a message anymore. So let's find something new. And the best thing I could come up with is let's be a lesson. If you want to be, uh, uh, if you want to run a good state, don't do like Lebanon. If you want to have a good future, don't be like Lebanon. I remember you on TV, and you, I think you would admit this, especially on future TV, as being the completely opposite personality of what you are right now. I think you would admit to a degree of this. There was a sign of always hope in what you were talking about. And no, I, I'm still, I'm very, like, I'm very positive because out of all this chaos, I found something, a niche for Lebanon, which, which is let's be a lesson and let's celebrate that. I'm fine. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the positive thing out of it. We, we, let's celebrate being a lesson, meaning that we, we let's celebrate being wrong. Let's celebrate people learning from us. I come from a generation where I thought I can live all the happy memories of that my father used to tell me about the Beirut in the 60s and early 70s. And all the narrative I saw on, on 
<clears throat> on TV or in books about how great we were and how what a proud nation we were. We were Hamzat al Wasl. Is there anything stronger than being Hamzat al I don't know what Hamzat al Wasl is exactly, but we were Hamzat al Wasl by Nasharqi wal Gharb. The Hamzat al the bridge between the East and the West. Maybe now we're the sukun. There is sukun, you know, the round thing. There's hamza, al hamza, sukun, fatha, kasra, damma. Sukun is the silent. I did not expect this kind of conversation. Okay, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It's fine. On the contrary, I did. Let's start over. No, delete, no, no, no. Delete. Restart. Y- you. On the contrary, it's actually the first time I actually get to know you more. I think it's kind of like a mask is finally off. Did you feel that way when you left Future? Because I think what you're doing now, it feels like it's a calibration of a lot of what you did on Future TV. And I'm not trying to undersell what you but did. But in, in Future TV, I was the other face of Future TV. Future TV was known to be the, the, the conservative family channel. On Future TV, I was the bad guy. I was the one doing the taboo issues. I was the one doing the, the I was talking about, I was doing, I, I, I did like lots of episodes about this book. Hmm. This book, my book about Lebanese war was born on Future TV in a show. In the show, I was talking about topics that Future TV didn't want to even to be mentioned. I was regarding politics, sex, religion, war, everything I can think of. But because I was always this serious journalist who was putting the things or any topic in the right context at the right timing, I could manage to survive. Mm. I had lots of uh, problems, disputes, mashakil, whatever. They all happened. But I, I could always manage to wake, to, to go through, like to overcome all difficulties. And at, at one point, it was like my main concern was not only Lebanon because we also we were also a satellite channel so my challenge was to have the Saudi audience the Kuwaiti audience the Arabs in the USA in Europe everywhere I want the whole world to watch me so I had I had to be relevant and not a propaganda machine and like all respectful channels or uh, that's one of my students at LAU <laughs> she's happy she saw me outside class. <laughs> so, uh, like the old channels, you always leave a space, you know, in the backyard. You have someone in the backyard to prove that you're, you're to prove or to show your, your good face or your, your you know, the, the, the other face of things. So I managed to do that and I was okay, but I was not within the system of the channel. Mm-hmm. I was the one to prove that there is a good face. To, this is why one of the very famous quotes that was very controversial when suddenly, because those two years, suddenly no one was like part of the, of the system or part of the establishment. Like everybody was not in the, there. Like you couldn't spot someone who would say, I was part of the Lebanese establishment that led to whatever hell we are in now. And, uh, and in one of my interviews, I said, well, I, I was like, they told me why I was not very active in the, in the revolt uh, phase. And I said, I cannot be active because I was the face of the establishment I, or, I, or I was part of the establishment. And then I said, like, maybe I was the good face of the establishment, but I was in the establishment. I cannot suddenly become a... Uh, this is uh, a Michelle Twainy episode on yes. Jadid. Yeah. And I said it like, and I was very frank about it, and I thought like, it's just a thought I'm sharing. And suddenly like, it became trending. Like, like now we know who the establishment was. <laughs> uh, or like someone uh, to have, uh, like to have the courage to say that it was part of the establishment. And of course, then it became part of the political thing, like, 
you know, using me to, to, uh, to attack everyone else who's, who's been in the establishment and now trying to be away from the establishment. But sorry, Zaven, you saw your role on Future TV as establishment? Of course, I am establishment. I am establishment. I, I was not uh, I was not anti established I, 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 I was, I was you proud. You have a show on Future TV. How is that establishment? You mean just that you were on media prior? No, no, no. no I, now when you say establishment, is it has this negative thing, but establishment is the, is the system, is the prevailing system. And I was part of it. And proudly I was part of the establishment. I was not passing by. I was I was changing I was deciding how things should happen how media should be I I today all to I and Allah najina min kelmet ana but I claim to have influenced talk shows in Lebanon and the Arab world until today I claim to change the whole face of Arab talk show so things that are are like considered to be new or I'm talking about traditional media my uh, my uh, uh, online platforms or online show or podcast it's a different story and i'm trying to go there and also to leave my mark but uh, but lots of like many things on traditional media today happening today and being considered like this is new i started them 20 and 25 years ago on tl and on future so i consider everything happening on television today in in talk shows is a continuation of a, of a line or of of a, of a way of thinking or of a, of a system or whatever you of a format but sorry how is your impact on lebanese and regional media an establishment problem on the contrary that's a positive influence that you've yes of course but uh, yeah but establishment is uh, so, like establishment is every Establishment is the ruling, is the order, is the ruling order of things. Sometimes things go wrong, and sometimes they don't. And you, like I, I at least I'm the established. I like I should like I cannot be but the establishment of my generation. And I'm okay if another generation comes and considered whatever I did is wrong, and they want to put me aside and start over. And I'm okay with dealing with younger media personalities coming and saying that everything I did is bad. Sorry, but who's saying that? I've never heard this kind yeah. of rhetoric about your role in media being problematic. Or old. Or out of fashion. That's different. It's the same thing. No, but that's... It's the same thing. There's a political angle you're applying it's a, to It's it. the same thing. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with someone coming and saying I'm outdated. I'm okay with that because I did the same thing in 92 when it came to the the stars of television at that time so i i believe in this generation gap in generation clash and whatever mm -hmm. and this is why now i'm a kind of like in a transitional phase between whatever i do on tradition traditional media and new emerging emerging media but i believe now in this uh, segmentation of the audience so i do a morning show for people in their cars, usually elder audience on the radio. I speak like Zaven in his 50s. And on the podcast, I try to be like a younger version of me, following the whatever rule of podcast is, and trying to change it or to put my, my mark on it. I want to make sure I understood this right. You being on a television station today, would that be problematic for you? No. So that's not establishment, meaning you were on a station that what that shut down. Establishment, meaning I was the system. I put the system. I am the establishment. I've, you know, it's interesting to hear this from you. I, I don't. I now no one says I'm the establishment. All the politicians they were part of the establishment, and then suddenly they leave the establishment, and they say we are anti-establishment or we are suwar or we are whatever but they were part of the establishment so your journey to alternative media is not uh i'm turning my back on television it's just general shifts in media it's general shifts but also you are uh, you are uh, nurturing different audiences because on traditional media you have still the the big chunk of the audience the elder audience the audience in the in outside the big cities are still on traditional media those people need someone to talk to them 
And I think I can bring the new platform, the sense of new platforms to them. Mm. And I can give, I can bring the maturity of the establishment to the new media. I'd so I'm trying to be this bridge between both. Like because there is no right or wrong. And I was not, I, I didn't do anything that would put me in on the list of the corrupted people, the, the payroll people in the establishment. It sounds like you're being too hard on yourself. No, no, I, I, I'm not being too hard. I'm, am I? I don't know. I, I don't think of you as part of any problem. And the contrary, I thought of you as a pioneer. In yeah, media. I am a pioneer, that, but you that, think the establishment is bad. I, I don't know your role as being bad. On the contrary. I, I was the good face of an establishment that was that ruled our lives for hmm. 25 years. There's a political weight to what you're saying that I don't think is there. You know, Diana Mellid, who was on Future TV, now runs Daraj Media. Yeah. I don't think her role on Future TV was problematic. And I think what she's doing on Daraj is actually a but good... But she was part of... I don't want to talk about Diana. Sure, sure. But uh, when I took the decision to be part of future television, I decided to be part of the establishment. At that time, I could have left Future TV and went to work in Nida Al Watan, which was which was an opposition newspaper, or I would have uh, left it and gone to a more alternative, unlicensed media outlet. I decided to be in the establishment. You cannot win on both sides. You cannot win as someone being part of the system and taking like uh, having the the politicians giving you sources and material material and at, at the same time you want to be the clean uh, alternative media person. You cannot be both. I don't this can be removed from the episode later. Just okay. for us. Are you referring to for Ra- us, are you are you referring to Rafi and Saad Hariri when you say establishment? I'm trying to understand. I'm referring to the system, the whole system. You know, this because deserve- those, because those, the media, me, all media outlets are owned by the politicians. Future TV was owned by the Hariri family. NBN is owned by Nabih Berri. Hmm. Uh, LBC was owned by whoever. So this is MTV is owned by whoever, and we are we. Those are the establishment. Did you? Did you? take a decision that was not your... I was part of the establishment. No, no, no. If at any point I was not happy in being part of the establishment, I would have left. That's what I'm asking you. So your books are completely your terms. You're yes. reflecting on Beirut in a way that makes sense to you. And it's uh, from what we discussed now... I the- fought in the establishment to have my own free space. I paid high price for that. What is that price that you're the, you're talking about? Your personal? Yeah, account? I'm personal. I paid in the establishment. We can call it something else. If 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 establishment is problematic, we can call it something I guess else. I, it's not the problematic. So I'm trying to understand your yourself. The system, the system, the 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 ruling system, the ruling establishment in media. You could have been on a payroll of a politician and being a corrupt journalist trying to uh, to uh, to be like to polish a mm. politician mm. or a party or whatever or you could have your own free space not benefiting of anything from this from the system like working as a professional journalist and living from your salary that you deserve mm. and you did and I did that. So I fought. So it was either money or freedom. And at one point when I had like, always I had, uh, I had like offers to leave Future TV and to go uh, in Arab or Lebanese outlets, but for more money. But I, I always thought, and my main question was, will I be free to do whatever I like to do? Will I be free, like really free? And the answer was always no. So I, I was thinking, I don't want to fight another war hmm. to have my own space. So once I did that in Future TV, I wanted to keep that and preserve that. I think you did. And yeah. that's why you have a career that's ongoing yes. in media. I, I know you... But not- I'm not ashamed to say I was part of the establishment, hmm. of the corrupt establishment. But I, but I say I was like, 
the the happy go lucky <laughs> in the establishment who always had a, a, a different vision and looking at things from a from a different angle let's talk about your freedom today yes you have you mentioned the radio show which you i mean i don't think it's just dinosaurs listening to you in the morning I know people that tune into you because yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. And your podcast career is quite interesting for me. Yes. Because I think you are the perfect host for a podcast. You're patient. You're never trying to outsize anybody. And I've been on your show twice now. I could do it regularly. It was your show anyway. It wasn't my show, no. I was. To you, he was supposed to host the show I'm hosting now. But because I'm lucky, at one point he said yes, and I was quick enough to say no and grab the opportunity. Other way around. I said no, you said yes. Yeah, no, yes, <laughs> yes. No. You're a better host than me for what you're doing by far. And you're, you're the kind of person that inspires me. I grew up watching you, Zivan. Mm. I wouldn't be so hard on yourself in your earlier career. I think if there's a system and the way you're describing it as establishment, I never put you in that camp. You're a face on future TV. Like many faces yeah. on future TV. Because I was always away from the narrative. I was not part of the narrative that the system was trying to tell people. The, 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 the narrative was the, the war didn't happen. I was writing books, doing episodes, bringing mothers and fathers and yeah. brothers still waiting for their loved ones who disappeared during the war. So I was always, even in, in, even in sex, when it comes to topic related to sex, the system was telling you you have to do the sexual act that way. One, two, three, step one, step two, step three. I came to suggest different steps. And people accepted that for millions of reasons, starting from my name. My name looked bizarre, or it sounds bizarre or strange or foreigner or whatever. So in, in the Khalij, in the Gulf, I was Zafin, <laughs> something that sounded like Oprah maybe, or a foreigner coming to the Arab world and with a twist, a show with a twist. And in Lebanon, I was Zavan, Zavan, uh, depending. Only in Bersh Hamoud, I was Zavan. For, for the natur of the building, you were Marseille. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best moment for me. <laughs> we had to correct him on the spot. <laughs> yes. Did, uh, did we? Well, we did. But I, did, I don't think he cared. You were still Marcel. And he took yeah. a lot of photos with you. No, but let's go. Well, so, so people get, because people, when they see me, they don't expect to see a face from TV. So it's, 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 you know, it's a bizarre moment. So the first name that comes to their mind, they just call the person. So a few months ago, someone called me Jad because he was your guest. And I say that because like my, several times, Marcel is called also with other names, Nashan, the same, Tony. So we know this joke about each other. So someone called me Jad. What was the first thing I did? No idea. I shaved my beard. Oh. That was a joke. <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me let me ask no, but you. I shaved my, my beard after you that. Did, I mean, I, last time I saw you, you yeah, had a it was thick a beard. beard. Yeah. Yeah. I said I can handle everything except for being Jad. That's funny. Well, I think you look fine <laughs> with or without a beard. <laughs> But let, let me ask you about what you're doing yeah. as a podcast host. You're doing pretty much the same thing you would have been doing on television yeah. outlets, meaning it's panel discussions. It's not only politics. You cover a lot of terrain. You even covered podcasting as an episode. Yeah. So are you in your element right now, and are you comfortable with where you are? You, in addition to lecturing, your students were here a second yeah. ago. You're doing, I think, everything that I would imagine a media expert could do without being on television. So is that, I mean, it's- you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to explore uh, and to see uh, what can I change in the podcast business or industry or line, whatever you name it. So I'm trying to find like my twist in it. I haven't found it yet, 100%, but eventually I will. So I should have my twist the same thing like I did in talk shows or in morning shows. I should come up with something that I think will like open a new line for how podcasts could be run. But one thing I, I, I am sure of that I make it sound like the re not like a game. It's like real. This is a real talk show thing. 
and uh, and the podcast it's a, it's an it's a modern version of a talk show in a different medium uh so it's in the, it's in the evolution phase for me and also for the whole podcast industry because it started audio now it's video tomorrow we don't know how it's evolving so i i want to be part of this thing but i'm not doing it as a young newcomer who who's who's playing or experimenting i'm doing it as the mature person coming from the establishment and trying to step a new world without without uh, without uh, offending or violating the uh, because that that's not my space that's a space for younger journalists who who might not have their chances yet in the established uh, media are you reserving yourself deliberately are are you being more conservative with what you'd like to do because you've put yourself in a category that may not be true I, I don't know why you're being so sensitive to the younger generation. You can be Zaven until you die. Yeah, no, of I, course. So why are you um, afraid of over, overstepping? Because you are overstepping. Because you cannot... You, know, you are overstepping. There's new. I teach students media. So I see how their mentality... A few weeks ago, I had like I was this I, I had a PowerPoint presentation, and there was I don't remember about what, and there was like a figure: thirty percent of the Lebanese do that, for example. And then one student like said, "Yes, that's true, because seventy percent of Lebanese also do that, and this might be related to that." And I said, "Wow, this is like new information for me. Could you send me the the source or the paper or whatever?" I said, yes, I'll send you a link. And he sent me a link. And I said, well, I have a student who reads. And it was a TikTok post. <laughs> he saw it on TikTok and he sent it to me as an academic reference. Is, was he wrong? I don't know. Ten years ago, when someone used to bring something from Google, we said the same thing. When, at one point, when I shot a video on my phone, and brought it to television, they said, well, this is phone. We cannot use it on broadcast television. We have to have this big camera to yeah. shoot something. Yeah, yeah. Before that, when, I don't, I don't know, when I went, for example, to As-Safir and not to Nahar to have my archive uh, research, I was considered to be you know, not going to the main source. So li- things change, life changes. And you, you cannot stay running all the time to adapt to new things. At one point, you come and you say, well, I'm tired. I don't, to, I don't want to try something new. Everyone has tried it. From Facebook to Twitter, from Twitter to Instagram, from Instagram to TikTok, to Snapchat in between. At one point, you say, Khalas, I'm tired. I don't want to try something new. I'm happy where I am. So I'm trying to, to discover and... Uh, explore but i don't want to forget my past forget where i was or i don't want to overstep younger generations thinking that whatever they are doing on broadcast or in their podcast is the right thing because for me it might not be the standards of what true journalism is like being editorial saying what they think not being not trying to be uh, objective uh, having a say in whatever talking more than the guests so those are, those are like no big nose on mm. on traditional media if i had to define your career without you being in the room because you'd be i think a little hard on yourself if i could rem- if i had to describe you it would be two moments the first is lebanon shot twice when it was published I immediately got to know your respect and your collective memory craft through mm-hmm. that book. And I always recommend that book. And I'm glad it's always being republished. Thank you. That's an important book for me. The second is Kana 1996. And you covering a post-war war. And I think of you as somebody who's serious about being maybe an unintended war correspondent. And you're showing the world a lot of gore. Yeah. And you're you know, on the- when I started, when I wanted to, uh, like when I entered university to study journalism, my dream was to be war correspondent. Oh, so. really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, that, then you were, and you were yeah. well-respected for everything you did at that moment. K- 
Can you think of key moments in your career that define who you are? Yeah, of course. Like the books, as you said, uh, the email. Also, talking about transitions, when I started to to communicate with my audience or to be interactive with my audience through emails, I was like, what is he doing? When in uh, 99, I started like to have my show on TV and then to continue it online, it was like, what is he doing? So I always played, I love, I love to merge technology and old, new, uh, compare, see what you can, like how to, how you can take, how you can take anything one, one step further. Uh, so, but at one point you tell us, you, you are tired. You don't, you don't want to experiment anymore. You want to live in whatever. So you're, you're talking about those good moments of my career, but also there's the trash TV. I've done lots of trash on TV and I'm also proud of that. For me, like it's not something I try to hide. I can I, at at one point I used to be like the king of trash. Stefan, I, I, not, I, I, I've been I've been called the what what was it the uh, the scumbag? No, no one refers to you as a scumbag. I, I, uh, You're not I, like I, 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 there is. I an, need to call Lori and tell her to stop is, yelling at you at home. <laughs> who's, there is who's an article you? like I don't I don't remember where. Uh, the scumbag of Lebanon, the Shu Said story. Who's calling you that, a scumbag? Yeah, I was told that. Habibi, everyone calls me things online too, but yeah. you don't take it seriously. Yeah, no, I no, I no, I'm not taking it seriously or not serious. I'm being proud of it and I'm moving on. Hmm. I I've considered this part of me. What do you mean it's by the colors? Sorry, Zavan, what do you mean by trash TV? What trash TV is being very uh, sensational. Uh, on TV, being very uh, audience-oriented, rating-oriented, uh, trying, but but the trash, I because, and like when I wanted to 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 be the number one talk show on sat on Arab satellite mm. television, and to be like the number one show because at that time there was ratings every year, annual reports of the number one show. So in the Gulf. Um, I I needed to do uh, more uh, taboo issues, and I so I was put in the category of being the 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 Arab trash TV, the face of Arab trash TV. But I survived because I I, I never lied. All my stories were real. All were all my stories were done not exploiting private people or private. Uh, personalities or not trying to take advantage of them i i brought those taboo issues and i wanted people to have the place to speak out whatever they want to speak out about whether that was their sexuality their political uh, or their sicknesses and illnesses so for 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 uh for years i was talking from adhd and we're talking 2003, it was like ADHD. What is ADHD? Mm. So you are introducing a new, uh, a new uh, problem that could be solved with uh, medication or treatment or whatever for an audience who think a person or a student or a student or a child who, uh, who cannot like, who's, who's not doing well at school is either uh, you know, without brains or someone has zaralo shu ismo amillo shaitani so by that at that time those were all considered to be outside the box topics closer to be trash to you plus i did lots of uh, stuff related to sex scandals but the difference between me and the whole trash uh, uh, line was that all my stories were real with people talking about real stuff i never brought them to teach them lessons or to label them or to tell them you're wrong you're right you're anti-establishment you're part you're anti uh, the general consensus i just brought them and i was curious to ask them about their story to ask them about how they see things and this is the, from this came the famous joke on mishu has said because when I was bringing a prostitute or an HIV positive or a gay person, I was not judging him and telling him, you're right, you're wrong, you made God angry, you made the system, whatever. I was just asking him, tell me your story. 
and I was all ears. That sound bite aside, that sound bite took on a life of its own. Hmm. Maybe we can. Yeah, that became a joke for reasons I think you know. Yes. People took it out of context. But um, mo- removing that little sound bite, pushing boundaries on television, exploring taboo subjects, and taking risks, you should be absolutely proud of. Yes, of course. So don't call it trash TV. Just because you had a bit of ratings and competition, that's television. That's the whole media. Yeah, but that's the good thing. Like also, that's it starts trash. Uh, because that's the definition. The, what's the positive aspects of trash? Because sometimes you bring people who are not welcomed in, in more established shows. Mm. You give them the chance for the ratings because they are bizarre. But you are giving the chance. You are giving them airtime. And if something real and sincere appears, they become part of the whole of the whole image or or you you then you are pushing boundaries so you would say for you it's it's the first email and it's pushing boundaries these are two things that stand out if you ever write an autobiography i'd like to be the editor (laughs) don't write it yourself (laughs) i want to fact check your anger and self-hate and i want to make sure you come out fine no, but the thing when when i say them i say them proudly i don't say them like i'm ashamed of them or it's well just be- it's the first time in 350 episodes i've heard someone be so hard on themselves Is with it? pride <laughs> and maybe it's different ways of interpreting your career yeah. i can't think of lebanese media without you and that's my experience on television on radio on digital media, alternative media, on a podcast. And I think for whatever reason, the fact is you're still here. You're still involved in media, establishment or otherwise. And I want to thank you for letting me push you on this stuff. And I I honestly appreciate it. I think you have a way of maybe honoring things that I don't think are necessarily... Could be honored or... Yeah, and I wouldn't call yourself a scumbag or a trash TV person. You're a talented journalist. You've always been so. So thank you, Zaven. Thank you. And I just I want to say something. Uh, we should. I don't know if we were supposed to talk about the book, but we've done. Like I want to thank you for the really nice episode you did about my book. And if you're like really interested in the book, Beirut Guilty Pleasures, please watch because it was like our journey together in those Beirut landmarks. We'll talk a bit about the book during the Q&A. If anyone wants to order something, please do so. We'll have a 15-minute Q&A after the okay. break, okay? And be nice to Zevin. Yes. <laughs> in return, he'll be hard on himself. <laughs> Thanks, Zevin. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. You need to worry about my interjection. It's not a question, actually. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I want to uh, I want to address actually three things that you said, and I hope you can uh, let me uh, just take address them, uh, address the three of them before uh, you answer me. If you will have any answer, uh, I would want to say that I, as a as a political activist for quite a while or a contributor to the revolution in one way or the other, have always been part of the establishment. And I think this is something that we should never be ashamed of because we didn't know better. I mean, I was raised by parents who um, were activists themselves and uh, they still followed and voted for the old establishment. And this is something I never shied shied away from. Uh, Even when I was told, like, even the financial status like when you get the, no, ma ante your bourgeoisie. I'm like, okay, but you know that bourgeoisie around the world, 
these are the people that start the revolution. These are the people that start the change, the real change, because they have the educational background, and then they develop it into something that is more concrete. So I'm proud to be with you in uh, this establishment, because this is what we had known back yes. then, and uh, what, ha what worked back then. And I think because of people like us, like, We become We, better exactly. people, the world becomes exactly. better place. Another thing I want to tell everyone here... So you those, identify yourself with me. Uh, yeah, of course I do. Wait until you hear my next one. No. <laughs> <laughs> I so, wait. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know Zavan or don't remember his show, uh, what he used to talk about, uh, there was a sentence that uh, resonates still with me until today. And I will say it in Arabic. Is that okay? Akid. Okay. شو كان شعورك لما؟ شو حسيتي لما؟ شو فكرتي لما صار معك هيك؟ أو ليش عملتي هيك؟ These these questions that used to trigger the human mind back then when it wasn't okay for people to ask other people what they feel about certain things. Because we were in a ta at a time, and I myself have always suffered from anxiety, but no one... No one knew what it was. No one knew that it was something that is uh, uh, a, concrete, a concrete mental uh, challenge and that it needs to be dealt with because rarely has anyone asked me, how do you feel about this? And I think this question is the, the, the question that I remember you by. Uh, sometimes, we, <laughs> sometimes we laugh about it because you're like, So my partner tells me when I ask him, how do you feel about this? He's like, what are you pulling off as a van? <laughs> so you're known by yeah. triggering people's emotions and going beyond what is seen, like the untold stories. So this is my second point. So until today, you're still with me and you still inspire me and whatever I do, because I also broke taboos because of people like you. So this is number two. Number three, which I would love to also say, When we talk about trash, there is some kind of uh, distinction that we need to offer for people. Uh, the approach in, in which way you put a story, when you, when you frame it, okay? the way you approach your guests, the way you, uh, you trigger uh, emotions or thoughts or ideas from your guests differ. And I can definitely tell you that, uh, that there is today on TV a lot of trash but you were never one of them because you had an elegant, classy uh, you, uh, approach to, to, to the conversation, to the topic you were discussing. You were never condescending. You were never cynical. You never override the conversation and the talk that your guest is giving. So this for me is something I also uh, remember when I do my conversations with people. So thank you for that. This is all what I wanted to say because uh, I want you to always remember that you inspire me and... Uh, thousands others thank you Hiba. i appreciate that thank you thank you Hiba, can you moderate the rest of this episode for me <laughs> one of the things that i'm planning to do is to learn to moderate well i mean thank you for that you said something that i couldn't have said better so thank you thank you Anjad. now let's judge Hiba dendashli as she walks out <laughs> her establishment no, no i'm joking are there any other questions is there any questions for zavan about media collective memory civil war anything no questions wow please yes <laughs> so first of all it's really good to see someone admit they were part of the establishment. It's very rare that people in our society would do that. So, good for you. That makes me proud of you, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we were having a bit of a discussion around as to why you would have done that. But yeah, for me, for example, and this is a question for you maybe, uh, I feel that part of the reason is that, especially as we grow older and as technology becomes more prevalent and like social media right now, like the tools that have been, that are available now that were not available, available back then, what would you have done when you were younger had these tools been available? That's my question. Yeah, thank you. 
tools always change every every two there, there's always new tools and you have to de to deal with them and people have different reactions towards everything new some people like jump in some people are very skeptic some people don't want to to try anything new i was from those pioneers who always wanted to experiment and to try something new so all the tools that i've used were new to my generation and to elder generation, to the generation before me in media. Uh, so uh, social media today is the same as uh, VHS compared mm. to whatever was before VHS or, you know, there, there, this, there, there has been this th technological evolution and we were part of it. And technology has always affected the message. It has always affected the message. It changes the message, uh, and uh, and I think what like what what makes my journey special is I always came in transitional period. I always sensed, I always sensed uh, transitions, and I built on transition. I invested in tra transitions. But let me add actually to this comment about social media have you been able to ride that wave in a way that suits you because this kind of shift is very new yeah okay but social media when, when you're talking or for example about facebook i was the first person yeah. to incorporate facebook on my show and uh, and before that uh, there was the messenger S -S uh, msn msn, MSN. So uh, te technology was always part of my work. Mm. I always tried to embed technology in my shows. Twitter, I was the first one on Twitter. Uh, for years, I was the most influential person on Twitter. Uh, but then it, uh, but when, like, when I made this shift from Facebook to Twitter, for example, and I was among the first, uh, and then when you see everybody there and it becomes so, con so, it, it becomes part of the general consumption. I just leave. So this is a character thing. So when people started to make, to be, to becoming uh, more famous or making money or making statements on Twitter, I, I was been there, done that. So I left. So you left social media as it was becoming more yes. important. It's part of my character. And, and for like four years of my life, when Future TV was on the decline and the social media and all the rest of the world was on the incline. And so, of course, my ratings dropped. And I, I took a decision and obviously it was a, a wrong strate strategic decision. And I said, I don't want people to know my news. I don't want people to follow me on Facebook or, on, or on Twitter. I only want, I like my only connection with the rest of the world want, want, I want that to be through Future TV. So I stopped everything. And my only message was, you want to see me, watch me on Future TV. So it was a kind of a daily message for four years. And I thought everybody will leave social media and come back to watch me on Future TV. I lost it. The same, th the same thing with my beard. I thought when I will shave, everybody will shave. And only three people I know shaved. <laughs> But now you depend on social media. Now. Yeah, of course. Now, when I when I was like when I tried to be back on yeah. social media, uh, I was already the 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 old guy, the bad guy, the establishment guy, the mutasabe guy, the, the person who's not who's not like I like who didn't who was not there when the party started, hmm. who came who came in late. So I have another question, but before, is there anyone else that one asks anything to Zaven? Can I ask someone to say something? I want her to say something because when I left, when uh, after the break, I was like feeling bad. What I was like, was I that bad? And she was, uh, she oh, made me feel it, okay. Tiala? No, I think she, does she want to? Yeah, she does. Give her the microphone. Uh, mafi, yeah. mafi sura, mafi camera, masik. make me happy. Fi sura. Uh, if you no, want to, no. if you want to, I don't just, want to. Just your voice comes say. out. Yeah. No, I just want to say thank you. Uh, you inspired us a lot. You taught me like so many things. Uh, you played a huge role in my childhood. And I think uh, maybe go back to your archive, watch the episodes, 
and you would revive that feeling. Uh, I'm proud that you are Lebanese and I've learned a lot from you. Like Thank I studied you. journalism and I think like, yeah, you deserve the best. You did like, you inspired us. Like now we can watch TV, we can learn a lot of things, but it's not easy to get inspired. So that's one of Thank the you. unique things Thank about you. you. Thank you. I hope I will be able to find my new message to the younger generation and to inspire them again. I'm really searching for my new calling in life. During the break, we actually talked a bit about your role as a lecturer on media yeah. at LAU. This kind uh, of at LAU and at Azam University in Tripoli. In Tripoli, right? And actually, you. I love to go to Tripoli once a week. You came early today to, from Tripoli yes. to do this. So this kind of reflection and deep, deep reflection that you have on yourself, which is, I think, unusual. You're able to really self-reflect and self-criticize to a point that's, for me, striking. Does that come from teaching a younger generation? Yeah, it comes from dealing with people who don't really know you, who know you from their parents, through the eyes of their parents, who think you are outdated, old-fashioned, you shouldn't be on TV anymore because they deserve to be on TV, or who have different values and standards and... Uh, Different values. Mm. Values have changed. Things I thought like you shouldn't do that. Like I may one one of like one of the things I also started in the in my in my in talk show in my talk show career is uh, uh, reality TV in talk shows. So just making like shooting twenty four hours and whatever. So it started with a very famous episode on uh, on uh, baggers, street baggers. And then you know when you do something and it works out and it, it you know you feel you want to go one step further, one step further. And one day I did an episode I wanted to see how people become when they are really drunk. When they're drunk, yeah, well, yeah. When you, when you, uh, when you, when you drink a lot, what happens? You go to uh, Will's concert on yeah. Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I did, we 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 brought ten uh, people. We put them in a big restaurant alone, and we just put the oh. alcohol till they like till they fall down, and we had everything on ten cameras, and I put that show. What happens when you're drunk? And like in today's standards, this is like really unethical. So this kind of you're talking to your classroom about things that you did like that. Is that no? I don't talk about this in the. Oh, classroom. you don't refer yeah. to that. I, I say I, do, I didn't do that. If you think I did that, I didn't do that. <laughs> but, the, but, but, but the, no, the, I'm just saying like the limits when you mm. push limits and when you do things at the time was considered to be uh, risky uh, or yeah, yeah very risky or very unconventional or whatever or trash even like you, you have all extremes uh, but the thing is I always uh, like I had the guts to try yeah and I, I always played it safe because I think I did it for a good reason not for a bad reason because I, I was really curious to know. But I'm sure having students, and you said it, many of them may not know that you were on TV just a few years ago. Yeah. I'm guessing there's some humility there as well. Because the way you reflect on yourself is striking. But I, we were speculating whether or not the classroom drives you to be more reflective. Yeah, of course, because you're, it's new values. Be I, I told you this story because I wanted to tell you, I wanted to tell you like even... Till the last day of my life, I will always regret doing that episode because I think at that time I broke a value that I should have preserved. The alcohol I, Yeah, I, I cannot force people to, uh, even if they have signed and mm. we have their consent, and, but still I'm interfering in their, in their very personal, it's a very personal thing anyways. Yeah. So uh, I still feel that I did something wrong. Now, 10 years later, maybe. But in today's scope, like, all values have changed. Was there another question? Yeah. Hi, Safa. Um, 
you started out the episode talking about uh, the war and that the war is over and now uh, we're in a different world. I disagree on this. Uh, war can take different shapes. Yes, war can be fighting. And during the fighting, and uh, when the war was uh, going on, I remember coming back and visiting. We were living abroad. Coming back and visiting, and we were having really good time, even though there was war. Uh, there's war across the street, and here we are dancing or partying or whatever, and we had money. And uh, 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 the, the, uh, Beirut, especially Beirut, was doing very well. Uh, yes, people were dying, but dying in a certain area, try to avoid it, then you're fine. Unfortunately, when the war quote unquote, stopped. The same people, and now here, I don't want to be shy because it's about time to tell, you know, the truth. The same people who uh, fought in the war, the same people took over the country. And that's when you talk about establishment. Now, the war kept on going but in a different way, in a different shape. Now, unfortunately, we're not in a war. We are in a, in a devastating war. We are in a non-ending war. We are all uh, suffering in each and every house. And each one of us now, if you talk about people now around us, uh, you, you hear different stories of how much they're having a hard time earning their living or uh, living a decent life. Now, uh, there is here in this transition, we had an, call it an agreement, call it, uh, call it uh, uh, a sort of a understanding between all countries in the world to stop the war physically. And we had a certain period of time, around 10 years, where we could almost breathe the, uh, uh, the Beirut that we always wanted. And we did see it. And that's where your part was. Your part in this time, when you entered the future and there was future television, everybody was envying you. Everybody was uh, wanted to be part of, uh, of uh, uh, being, uh, to pass by future TV and see the people entering and working in future TV. Um, unfortunately, 10 years later, they killed that man. And that man who made us live the hope of good Lebanon died, and the country died. And ever since, whatever you want to talk about Beirut, the old Beirut, or Beirut during those 10 years, I don't think we'll ever witness it while we are alive, at least not in our generation. So uh, that uh, that uh, feeling of sorrow, I think, would stay with us for a long, long time. And uh, I think we lost it. We lost it. Unless a miracle happens. But I don't see it. Uh, Lebanon would be back to a decent place to live in where we will all be... Uh, uh, at least a middle class. Uh, it's very unfortunate, very sad uh, situation, but that's where we are now. So, uh, good luck. You call it depression, <laughs> call it, uh, yeah. you know, living uh, a misery life, uh, but that's where we are. I see the real Lebanon abroad, not anymore in Lebanon.
I see the true real Lebanese people abroad. And I am telling you this because we lived it. We lived it in Washington. We lived it in Florida. We lived it in Los Angeles. We saw people in Europe, in France. All Lebanese people are wonderful, doing excellent abroad. But in Lebanon, Lebanon, I think we lost it. Now maybe we'll have a different kind of Lebanon. Um, I sometimes say Lebanon could be for a while Gazi, could be for a while Somal, uh, you know, just uh, a passing by country, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, I love this sentence you said, uh, there is a better version of Lebanon outside Lebanon. I'll ask one more and then we can wrap it up. Was was there any other question? Anyone? No. I will leave it with this. You're entering your prime, in my opinion. You're in your 50s. You're on digital media. You have several shows in the making. And you have several shows that are being produced. And I have a show now coming next month for the first time in Lebanon. A show that runs on all Lebanese local channels. Right, which is, I think, a first of its kind. Yes. What is the name of that show? Uh, I'm not supposed to say the name because it has a new name now. We'll wait for that show, but that's good. In other words, you're going back to television. Yes. So you're lecturing media. You talk about media for a living. And you write books about collective memory. Can you? And I have a book on Lebanese television. Also, I'm doing the part two of it. Now. Right. So you're you're doing all of I'm the active, above. Active, yes. You're yes. very yes. active. Can you offer words of wisdom to an up and coming journalist that is going through a very difficult stretch of time? Maybe they have a smartphone. Maybe they use social media. But I think they could learn a lot from you. It doesn't have to always be just TikTok or yeah. digital social okay, media? I, uh, I don't know if I'm, I don't want to, to sound cliche, but I just want to say like, live your dreams, whatever your dreams were. And if they tell you TikTok is bad, just ignore. And if you love TikTok, be active on TikTok. Don't be ashamed of new technologies. So embrace these whatever, trends. Whatever, yeah. And if you were to write another book about Beirut, what would it be about? Would it be an update to these books? Uh, now I'm working on, it's an, it's an ongoing project about on uh, the part two of Lebanon on screen. This Lebanon on screen tell the whole story of Lebanon through pop culture and Lebanese television. This book starts in 1959 with the, with the first uh, bro- TV broadcast in Lebanon, and it ends in 1990 with the end of the uh, civil war so it mm. covers the uh, pre-war the, up yeah until. The, esta- the established the founders tv mm. and then the golden age of lebanese television and the wartime television and now i'm working on the post-war television like 90s till lol on otv and that would be your career in it yes. as well yes one of the my problems in this book is how where to place myself and this is why i'm very self-critical so uh, so when i talk about myself i'm talking about myself as the author of lebanon on screen oh interesting okay well again i want to edit that book <laughs> <laughs> i will echo what i'll be very happy if you edit that book. yeah and it'd be an honor for me actually i'd like to i have it on tape now <laughs> that's true i want to echo what hiba said before she left Whatever it is that people remind, remind, the way you're remembered, maybe slapstick sometimes. Shu hased, shu hased, maybe is silly, maybe. But I like the way she put it in perspective. You opened the door to many topics that were not explored in my lifetime yeah. here. And I'll echo what Dalia said as well. There are many journalists, up and coming journalists, that refer to you. So the way you, th- the way you reflect on yourself is healthy. But, but can I, I say something uh, about Shuhasset? You look at Shuhasset as a joke. I look at it as a as a 
I'm a, I'm a, I'm a proud moment from my life. Why? Because for me, Shah Hasset is a joke on all comedy shows, but at the same time, it's a Palestinian, uh, uh, Palestinian uh, prisoner or uh, in, a, in an Israeli jail writing to me after she was out of prison that Shu has said for her meant life. Why? Because when especially Palestinian girls are in jail and they go out, they come out. So they ask them, did they, were you raped? They say no. Were you uh, left without food? They say no. Did they beat you? They say no. They tell them, their parents, okay, you're fine, go. And this uh, woman from uh, after her prison experience told me no one asked me ever Shu Hasseit. and apparently in uh, in the Israeli jails they were allowed to watch Lebanese televisions because oh. for them that was only entertainment you right. know you will be dumb you know watch Lebanese <laughs> television and you will forget about your Palestinian coast so and among the shows they were allowed to watch was my show and when they saw me asking people Shu Hasseit, for them like they wanted someone to ask them what did they feel in the prison. Well, there you go. That's the kind of impact you've had. So this is this is why for me I don't have a problem with Chahasset. I I don't laugh at yeah. people like joking about it or with people joking about it. But I'm over it. Like it's part of me. I'm Chahasset guy and I'm the email guy and I'm the guy who opened up sexuality on uh, on Lebanese television because I think like my my the thing I did about social slash uh, uh, sexual topics is that it was uh, sexual topics were always put like this is education we're, we're doing sexual education so when I started talking about sex it was not sexual education it was sex the act itself how to make it better bigger wider talk about it freely without without being ashamed or without being embarrassed or without yeah. or talking about it openly whether we have questions, we should ask the questions to the right people, or we have uh, cer certain uh, 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 like preferences. Also, we have to address them as they sh as it should be. You have to end up and drop out. I'm sorry. No, no, it's the way you address it. I think was just fine. And whether you're on future TV or off future TV, whether you're part of the establishment or the anti-establishment, you're still an important voice in this country. You're also a very gifted collective memory author. These are fantastic books. In particular, my favorite, Lebanon Shot Twice. Yeah. I think this book stands on its own. Yeah, and it's a great you. contribution to my generation, the way I think of Beirut. Now, through all this conversation, I want to end it by saying, I know you love this city. And you've told me that in person. You've explained it in different ways. But I feel also a measure of honesty that is new to me. And I can learn from that as well. We're getting a little older, and maybe some perspective is healthy. So I'm glad you did that tonight. Thank you, Zevin. Thank you. And thank you all for coming here. Uh, and uh, and uh, really, I want to thank you for your friendship, honesty, and having me in your show for the second time. And I'm very happy that you did this show here. And by the way, when they first opened here, uh, I don't know if they are still the same owners, how they've changed. Yeah, yeah, we not. had the project of doing my show here, uh, Sirem and Fatahat. So we were thinking of doing special episodes from here because they had this, I love this mix of culture, uh, food, mm. uh, a, a, gather, a, gather, a place for gathering. It was the only place that they could permit animals inside, dogs and whatever. So uh, I didn't do it then. I don't know why, what happened or why we didn't continue on this project, but I'm happy that you're doing it. So I gave you your podcast. You yeah. gave me your <laughs> okay, show. This, yeah. And we're okay. still here yeah. side by side. And I want to thank Ashet Antoine for still printing books in Beirut. I wanted to mention this. Anyone that's interested, these books are in Antoine. You can also get them on AntoineOnline.com. Yes. Uh, I am biased. Lebanon shot twice. The fourth edition. Beirut Guilty Pleasures is the tour. And yeah. if you're walking around Beirut, it's a great manual, companion. Zaven, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> we did it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Shukran. So what do you do? <laughs> 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 Thanks.
Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. Thank you.